Thanks, Rebecca, for the great introduction. Um, thank you, everybody. This is a great showing. I'm a little nervous <laughs> uh, for coming to the talk today. Um, I'll be sharing my dissertation work, as Rebecca mentioned. Um, it was on the genetic architecture and associated mechanisms of gray resistance to gray leaf spot. Um, you might be wondering why I picked the photo of Blacksburg. Well, one, it's a gorgeous photo. Um, two, Blacksburg will always have a very special place in my heart, um, just because when you're working those long field days, um, it's nice to uh, turn around and have that sort of scenery. <laughs> so well, I'll start. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll start off the talk by going over a little bit of the biology and genetic, uh, what was previously known about the genetics of resistance. Um, follow that up with genetic architecture, um, those resources that our lab uses, uh, gray leaf spot, and its relation to other traits. Um, and then follow it up with elucidating mechanisms um, underlying resistance, specifically with regards to leaf architecture, detoxification, and allelic variation in basal defense and hypersen the hypersensitive response. Great. So um, first, a bit of the intro. Um, gray leaf spot is a foliar, uh, leaf, uh, foliar pathogen, and um, uh, the symptoms of the disease are rectangular, tan, or gray-colored lesions that increase in number and coalesce, coalesce to eventually um, uh, completely blight the leaf and result in loss in photosynthate um, production. This um, disease has been attributed to yield losses of up to 70% or so. Um, and, um, and the causal agents of the disease are Cercospora zaimatis and Cercospora zaina. What's really interesting about those two is that they're present in different locations. So in the US, uh, C. zaimatis and C. zaina are present, um, as, as well as in South America. In um, maize growing regions of Africa, C. zaina are present. Um, and in China, so many Cercospora uh, zaimatis has been reported that I'm aware of. Um, something else to, to know is that this disease, uh, we, we have a running kind of joke in our lab. We battle between first and second place of being the most important disease uh, <laughs> with uh, northern leaf blight. So. Okay. Um, the success of the Cercosporin species are attributed, is mostly attributed to this production of Cercosporin. Um, it's a light, light activated molecule. I'll go into it in just a second. Um, when you just uh, treat the leaf with Cercosporin alone, it, it, the symptoms turn out much like the symptoms look of the actual pathogen. It's very interesting. Um, something else that, to note is that uh, on the, these um, dye cots, Uh, peanut, basil, and coffee, the lesions are uh, round, whereas um, on the uh, maize monocot, you can see that it appears as if it's uh, restricted or bound by the, um, the venation, the uh, major vein specifically. Okay, so um, as mentioned, Cercosporin is a light activated molecule um, that results this activation results in the production of active oxygen species, specifically, um, specifically to note the singlet oxygen, because the, path, the plant doesn't often come across that molecule. Um, this production results in membrane damage, cell death, and leakage of the nutrients, which um, benefits the fungus, um, specifically the necrotrophic phase of a uh, gray leaf spot, or Cercospora zaimatis. Um, since the plant often comes across the oxygen radicals, hydroxides and hydrogen peroxides, it's uh, predicted that um, these enzymes, superoxide dismut dismutase, peroxidase, um, and catalase manage a lot of that. But what's not so often come across is the singlet oxygen species. So um, it's hypothesized that carotenoids uh, deal with that by quenching the singlet oxygen and um, uh, reducing its ability to, to uh, basically damage the cell. Okay. Um, uh, Jesse Poland, a former lab mate of ours, most of you are familiar with him, um, he wrote an article called Shades of Grey. Him and colleagues wrote an article called um, Shades of Grey, The World of Quantitative Disease Resistance. 
um, he came, they came up with about five uh, hypotheses based on um, previous literature of mechanisms underlying quantitative disease resistance. So these were morphology and development. Um, they represent mutations or allelic variation in basal defense. Um, they're components of chemical warfare, defense signal transduction, as well as weak forms of R genes, meaning that they've just lost, lost their effectiveness over time. Um, so when you're starting a project, it's important to do your homework, um, and especially when you're writing your dissertation. Uh, so so I identified, uh, well, um, before I started, there were six uh, GLS QTL studies. And um, uh, she et al. did a seventh, of, uh, which was a meta-analysis of the first six. And she identified six, uh, well, um, QTL hotspots on chromosome one, two, four, and eight. Um, since I've, I've been here, I've been here for six years, nearly, um, <laughs> there's been three more studies that have come along for gray leaf spot. And uh, in the yellow, the yellow stars indicate that those are additional QTL identified, the hypotheses um, identified by the literature um, on those chromosomes. So they really do support this idea of hotspots on one, two, four, and, and eight. Great, right, so um, these, I wrote a list of questions that I addressed specifically um, in this talk, but through, throughout my um, dissertation. Um, these questions don't come up overnight for sure, so you know, some of the early ones, that was probably a year one type of question, but as we go, it's more like year four or five. Um, so what else can we learn about the genetic architecture of resistance to gray leaf spot? How does this architecture relate to that of other traits? Is leaf veination a mechanism underlying resistance? Are increased proportions of detoxification related genes uh, underlying a QTL indicative of the resistance mechanism? And can host plant response identified in micrographs be <coughs> associated with QTL? Um, and uh, you'll see these questions addressed throughout my talk and I'll provide a summary at the end. Okay, so um, first I'll talk a little bit about the genetic resources of our lab that our lab uses, and then go up, move on to the genetic architecture of GLS. Um, so I just took the time to conceptualize the resources that our lab uses, um, and it turned out to, it came up in a pyramid format. Um, the inputs being in green, the outputs being in uh, orange and the pyramid um, holding the tools that help us get to the, the outputs. Um, so we start off with uh, natural variation and you um, use genetic mapping and association mapping um, to get the QTL or associated SNPs. You can also, once you have the QTL, you can do meta-analysis <laughs> studies. Um, with the, this information, you can do within gene association, uh, find mapping with nearly isogenic lines to get uh, better candidate genes or, um, more, or better confirm your associated SNPs. Um, in order to get at the functional variation, it's good to use mutant transformance expression analysis. Our lab has um, used at least mutants in expression and we hope to shift towards the transformant gear. Um, and then to really get at the underlying biology and disease resistance mechanism, uh, microscopy and uh, mechanical and biochemical assays are useful. And it should be noted that um, the other, much of the uh, science, scientific community uses um, the inverse of this approach. So you can literally flip the uh, pyramid upside down and go about it that way by knocking out specific genes and looking at the function. Okay, so most of my work, um, was founded, well, my work was really founded on um, using the nested association mapping population. And so this is where I'll, I'll start. I'll start. Um, this population was developed by Ed Buckler and uh, the Mays Diversity Group. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction. I know that most people are familiar with it. It's, uh, a, oop, it was derived from a cross between B73 here and one of 25 diverse parents. Um, recombinant inbred lines were developed using single seed descent. Um, and there's about 200 lines per population. However, I only used 150 because I had an offsite location. At least for the first year, it was, it was just me. Um, <laughs> and 
and and just the size of the field made it more um, it was better for 100 150 lines were better for the side size of the field um, so the field was recommended to me via uh, Margaret Smith which is one of my committee members um, she she had a close relationship with Eric Stromberg an ad hoc committee member um, and it's a field that was historically inoculated, uh, grown in continuous corn and no-till for nearly three decades now. Um, so presumably the debris from the previous season had the, uh, um, had the uh, spores for the current. So um, anytime you hear me talking about disease ratings, uh, I'm talking, or, or AUDPC, I'll be discussing this uh, method or I'll be referring to this method where um, I scored all of each line three times over say seven day intervals with a um, disease index 20, uh, 20 point scale. Okay, uh, since I'll be referring to area under the disease progress curve so often, I just thought I'd give a, um, a quick uh, nod to that topic. This is just a chart taking uh, taken from um, the SIP page. Uh, so basically, imagine if your ratings are 8, 25, 65. Um, you take the average between the points and then multiply that times the, the, um, uh, times the difference between the time at which those points were taken and then sum those two points. So here it's um, 165 plus 450, so 650. Okay. Um, so move on to the some of the initial observations. Um, fortunately for uh, this project and myself, the distribution of gray leaf spot was continuous in the NAM population. Um, and we, we anticipated this because uh, Jesse Poland had looked at northern leaf blight and Kristen Kump had looked at southern leaf blight. Um, the B73 uh, uh, presents itself as moderately resistant and um, there's a a fairly normal curve. Okay, so um, I identified QTL using a joint linkage mapping. Um, uh, the disease, I developed disease, uh, let's see, best linear unbiased predictors from the disease ratings. Um, these were used to calculate area under the disease progress curve, which was put as a um, response variable in a general linear selection model. Um, the covariates of population and day stand thesis were then um, included along with the marker data and um, uh, markers were selected with a threshold of 10 to the minus 4 um, based on uh, the, the FDR, um, false discovery rate. So, let's see, I confirmed. Um, or other studies confirmed 10 of the, or I confirmed, yeah, other studies confirmed 10 of the QTL that, um, that I had uh, identified using the NAM. Um, and then additionally, six novel GLS QTL were identified. Um, six of these, the ones that were confirmed had improved resolution using the NAM. And what I find to be the coolest thing is um, that uh, the four QTL identified by Sagai Maruf um, in 1996 were also identified by me. Um, and that's relevant because I used the same field site as Sagai Maruf, um, and we don't depend on that um, actually inoculating every plant. We just depend on the inoculum um, from, the, from the previous seasons. Um, so this suggests that while the population um, likely shifts over time, there's at least the same pressures that are driving the plant to use um, similar uh, disease res resistance mechanisms. Okay, so something else that you get from the general linear selection model are the um, allelic effect estimates, excuse me. Okay, so this graph has quite a bit of information, so I'll lead you um, all through it. In the, um, in the, uh, this the first column, you have the parents, um, and then these are the bins associated with the, the marker that was in which the marker associated was uh, falls within. Um, for those of you who aren't necessarily familiar with maize um, bin nomenclature, the first number is the chromosome, the second number, um, the next two digits are the uh, relative location of the QT, of the um, relative location on that chromosome. 
Um, so as expected, based on the, the, those continuous images that we had, uh, that continuous distribution seen in the images that we had looked at before, um, there's also a continuous distribution of AADPC um, in which uh, blue indicates resistance and red indicates susceptibility. Um, so the most important things that we pull from a table like this uh, is, is, is two points. One being that, for example, in uh, 4.05, we have allelic effects being above and below zero, uh, which is um, presumed to be the B73 allele. Um, these were, um, this, uh, in, we infer this to mean that there are multiple alleles at this locus, but even more so, we're finding that, um, and I'll talk about that later, we're finding that as, um, as you find MAP, the, the single QTL are really breaking down into two QTL or, or more, I presume. Um, so more than just being uh, different alleles of one gene, it could be just multiple genes. Um, and then for uh, the resistant and, for very resistant and very uh, susceptible lines, really all throughout, um, you can see that there's both resistance and susceptibility factors. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the relation to other traits, specifically flowering time and other diseases. Um, we see this relationship with uh, many of our diseases. Um, if day stand thesis on the x-axis, um, disease progress on the y, uh, it accounts for quite a bit of the variation. Um, however, if you look at just one spot, uh, one, the 77.5, there's still a bit of variability a good bit of variability um, as to the disease progress. Um, we see this negative um, significant relationship across uh, northern, uh, northern leaf blight and southern leaf blight as well. Okay, um, so all of these spots are data points from recombinant inbred lines within the NAM population. Um, I collected them in, uh, in throughout my field seasons because flowering time is it was important to collect flowering time um, relative to the location that I was uh, collecting disease data as well. Okay, so um, in order to assess whether or not we were seeing linkage or pleiotropy, um, I looked at the uh, disease allelic effects um, across QTL that were in common between disease and flowering time. And um, the, the uh, Association, the relationship, it breaks down quite a bit. So the R squared drops significantly as well as the p value. So we infer this to um, suggest that the, the, um, while there are highly linked, the pleiotropy isn't as significant. And a recent heredity paper, paper out of um, Buckler's uh, lab had confirmed that. Um, okay. uh, before I go into the relationship with other diseases, I uh, thought that I would just give a little bit of a background with of northern leaf blight and uh, southern leaf blight. This is a figure um, developed by uh, Randy, Randy Weiser. He's a former lab, uh, lab member of Rebecca's, and he's also in, uh, he's currently a professor in Delaware. So um, what are we looking at here? We have uh, southern leaf blight, northern leaf blight, and gray leaf spot. The pathogen for southern leaf blight is cochleobulus heterostrophus. Um, for northern leaf blight, Pseudosphaeria tersica, and for gray leaf spot, as mentioned, Cercospora zaematis. Um, you can see that heterostrophus, uh, C. heterostrophus and S. tersica are quite a bit more related to each other than either of them are to Cercospora zaematis. Um, when you look at the actual biology, um, uh, C. heterostrophus enters, uh, releases its toxin, and um, immediately kills the cells. Um, uh, Ceusferia tersca, we believe from some of um, the, Im the images that, well, it's been published uh, by Chao Lin Chung, a former lab member of ours, that the pathogen um, enters in through the venation and uh, goes through the, the, um, the leaf first and then later will uh, broaden out. Um, and this was an initial understanding of gray leaf spot. Uh, some of the microscope work microscopic work that I've done has kind of altered our uh, vision of what GLS is doing in the earlier stages. Um, so previously it was believed that it just immediately went in through the stomata, um, infected and killed the tissue. Um, and then, but uh, we think that now 
it's actually following a similar pattern as um, uh, Cetisferia terska, except that instead of going into the vein, it's wrapping itself around the vein, um, around the veination, and uh, traveling up that way. Great. So um, this figure is basically showing where uh, other traits co-localize with uh, other trait QTL co-localize co -localize with GLS trait QTL. Um, specifically DTA, synthesis, intervein distance, northern leaf blight, and southern leaf blight. Um, I believe I had uh, previously mentioned that uh, Jesse Poland looked at the NLB, collected the NLB data, and Kristen Kump collected the southern leaf blight data. Um, anytime that you see a, a colored box, that indicates that the QTL overlapped. Um, and then when uh, you see a star indicates that there's a significant relationship between the allelic effects um, of the two different traits. So here we're looking, there was a significant relationship between um, DTA and GLS, as expected. Um, as, and the relationship is negative, as expected. Uh, and then for northern leaf blight, it's a positive relationship, which has positive breeding implications. Um, but when you're thinking about this locus, uh, you might want to consider that there could be negative breeding implications for, um, for southern leaf blight. Okay. Um, I looked at the relationship across all of the, the colored boxes to check if they were significant, but um, unexpectedly, the, unexpectedly, the only place in which it was significant um, was along uh, northern leaf blight loci. Um, and fortunately, these are all uh, positive relationships which has uh, great implications for scenarios like this, where um, GLS, a GLS epidemic is present with a northern leaf blight epidemic. This is a great image um, taken by Rebecca in a um, uh, maize, maize field in Africa. Okay, something else that um, we noted, um, or we sort of started to hypothesis, hypothesize this um, after year one, um, but it's been really become really evident over time. Um, each circle that you're looking at is a different QTL, and then um, the mean effect size of that QTL is relative to the, si to the size of the bubble. Um, what we uh, had hypothesized was that um, GLS QTL are fewer in number and uh, have, tend to have greater effect size than northern leaf blight. And we found that it also has it with southern leaf blight. And I just have DTA in here as a, um, as a, rel a reference. Um, and these differences are quite significant, which um, became more exciting after reading the um, heredity, heredity paper out of um, Ed Buckler's lab uh, that just came out. I'd suggest reading it. It's pretty cool. Um, but it basically, uh, this suggests that GLS may be more recently emergent, and the literature also suggests that GLS may be more recently emergent than um, the other two diseases. Okay, so um, back uh, onto the next, the last section of my talk. Um, it's with regards to actually elucidating the mechanism underlying resistance, specifically leaf architecture, detoxification, and allelic variation in basal defense and hypersensitive response. Um, for veination, it collected and scanned leaf samples in 2009 and 2010, took three um, uh, leaves from each line over time. Um, this took a, a quite a bit amount of time. Um, so you might want to consider it if you're thinking about um, actually taking images <laughs> for any sort of real breeding program. Um, uh, and then I measured the distance between the veins and um, lesion characteristics, uh, specifically the dimensions in the area. Um, I found that these, uh, well, in black we have the veination QTL in red, the GLS QTL, and four uh, spots in which it's co-localizing. Um, the 4.05 near isogenic lines, um, well, the 4.05 QTL is, is, is uh, quite large. Um, and I, I had developed isogenic lines to fine map, but it was not 
it, it was not feasible, at least with the population that I had to, um, developed it uh, based on the K11 and the B73 allele. Um, this region has 8% recombin relative recombination, and you can see that it takes up a huge amount of the physical space. Um, but what we were able to get out of this was that um, uh, we were able to find a significant difference between the uh, Venation distance in KI11 and the B73 allele. And the KI11 has the greater venation distance, um, which is, is interesting because it's also the most susceptible allele. Um, it's also the susceptible allele at the 405 locus. Okay, so you might be wondering, well, what, you know, who cares why does venation vein distance um, matter? Uh, Berger um, had in, uh, in University of Florida hypothesized that uh, mechanisms underlying quantitative resistance may be um, reduction in sporulation and reduction in expansion, uh, lesion expansion. And so when, um, so I measured the intervein distance and uh, the canidia four count. And the canidia fours are the secondary inoculum um, structure, production, um, secondary inoculum production structures um, of gray leaf spot. So, um, in general, the more uh, narrow the veins, the less canidia for production. And this is interesting, especially with a, a disease like gray leaf spot, which is polycyclic. And so um, that just means that the, it does produce secondary inoculum throughout the season, um, whereas some monocyclic pathogens just depend on that initial production of debris, uh, uh, spores. Okay, so um, back to the hypotheses. We, we believe that um, reduced lesion expansion and reduced sporulation may be playing a role in um, gray leaf spot uh, resistance. Okay, so um, uh, now I'll move on to detoxification. In order to, use, in order to look at detox um, at a specific QTL, I use near isogenic lines. Um, the nearest genetic lines were actually HIFs. This is a much more rapid way of producing um, uh, near, nearly isogenic lines um, because you're, look, you're taking recombinant embed lines that are heterozygous at QTL of interest already, and you're just um, further selfing those to identify more recombinant breakpoints. Um, so it, I had mentioned uh, this, um, that I tried to find map the 4.05 locus. Um, there are also two other loci um, that I looked at, but today I'll just be talking about uh, the one on chromosome chromosome one. So the, um, but in general, when you're taking this approach, you just self down the the recombinant inbred line. Those fixed lines you screen. Um, the those that are cell heterozygous you self, and um, and look for increased uh, Breakpoints. Okay, so um, for let's see, QGLS, I looked at uh, QTL GLS 105, 2.09, and 4.05, and confirmed those QTL um, using that this HIF strategy. Uh, there was a significant difference from the CML 228 allele. It was significantly more resistant than the B73 <laughs> allele at that locus. Um, the CML333 allele was significantly more resistant by 22%. And the K11 is a little different. Um, it's more uh, susceptible than the B73 allele. Uh, but in general, what we noted was that these um, numbers observed in the field were quite a bit higher than the NAM estimates um, uh, found at the top. So we, we think that this comes and in, takes into um, what we should take into question is whether or not it's appropriate to uh, look at blobs just from three years of data because it might be capturing some of the variation or too much of the variation that you actually see in the field. Um, also, covariates such as uh, DTA might, apture, might capture um, the variation too. However, uh, when I entered covariate, uh, DTA as a covariate in the HIF models, I didn't see a significant difference in the least squared mean estimate of um, change in disease. Okay, so this is the 1, 1.04, 1.05 region. Um, here's the QTL outlined in red. 
um, and then the actual fine mapping interval. As I had mentioned, this was, or I sort of alluded to, this was um, one, one peak initially, and through the fine mapping process, it broke down into two peaks. Um, I looked at the genes um, underlying these peaks, and it seemed like there was a high ab um, abundance of uh, detox-related genes. Um, but when I actually looked at uh, glutathione S-transferase abundance in this region compared to that of the uh, genome, there was a significant, there was significantly um, it, more, more of an abundance in the 1.04, 1.05 region. Okay, so what, what else is going on with this um, region? We have uh, flowering time, QTL, however, there's the allelic effects aren't, the relationship is not significant. Um, and then northern leaf blight and southern leaf blight QTL, um, where in the northern leaf blight QTL is the only significant, uh, is where we, only where we found a significant relationship. Okay, so um, I looked at expression analysis, I did expression analysis at this, uh, with this locus and looked for functional variation of um, the detox-related uh, genes in this locus. Um, this is my greenhouse setup. There were four blocks, uh, three subreps of each iso uh, nearly isogenic line. Um, the lines were treated with a circosporin and acetone treatment and with a circosporin control on either side of the midrib. You can see that here. Um, and uh, I screened about 22 of the uh, detox-related genes in the region, and there was one in which the expression was uh, significantly different. This is a putative flavin monooxygenase. Um, with the CML223 allele, the resistant allele, you see significantly more production after treatment with circosporin. Okay, so, well, what, um, I was wondering what role flavin monooxygenases play in um, disease resistance. I found a few articles, um, uh, one in which it's, it's believed to be an essential component of uh, SARS, systemic acquired resistance, another where there's um, involved in glucosinolate biosynthesis, but it may not be applicable to maize because um, glucosinolates are, um, are in much greater abundance in the brassica. Um, but here, there's a, an oxidoreductase um, that's involved in circosporin degradation in, uh, the bacteria, by the bacterium Xanthomonas campestri. Um, this was done in North Carolina by um, Margaret Dubb, who uh, has worked on circosporin for quite some time. So it would be interesting, and I'm not going to be able to do that during my time um, here at Cornell. Uh, but it'd be neat to transform this bacteria with the putative um, flavin monooxygenase to see if it's having that same role. Okay, so um, there's another mechanism that we think may be underlying a gray leaf spot detoxification. Okay. And then um, lastly, looking at allelic variation in basal defense and the hypersensitive response. In order to do that, I looked, I took a microscopic approach. Okay. Um, gray leaf spot is a really hard disease to get uh, an epidemic going in the greenhouse. We haven't had any success with it personally. Um, and so I went to the field for this. So it's really important to make sure that the, um, that the, to make sure to screen the plants that they were only getting uh, GLS. So um, here we just have a field of green, and a, I used a complete Latin square design, six five by five blocks. Um, each of the five by five blocks had uh, 25 diverse parents from the nest association mapping population. Um, chlorotic and necrotic lesion samples were collected from uh, each of these lines, and they were stained with either aniline blue to detect the fungus, and um, scored for fungal development or stained with propidium iodide to look at uh, cell death. And this was, this was additionally scored through the images. Um, so for each sample, I looked at fungal development, cell death, ab uh, presence absence of canidia fours, agronomic traits, and the presence absence of callus plugs and uh, fluorescence accumulation. And for the talk today, and I looked at the relationship across all five of these components, but for the talk today, I'll just focus on 
um, this part, callus plugs and fluorescence accumulation. Okay, um, there was a, um, a sh association between callus plugs and um, FA in which it reduced um, fungal development in which its, its presence um, was associated with a reduction of fungal development. Um, and we also saw that increased occurrence of cell death was associated with fluorescence accumulation. Um, Canadia fours were absent in the presence of uh, samples exhibiting callus plugs. And there appeared to be um, significantly increased resistance among lines that exhibited either uh, fluorescence accumulation or callus plugs. So we inferred um, by like, looking out at all of this that um, this uh, phenotype of CP and uh, FA appeared to be a host um, resistance response. Okay, um, so when you look at the um, relationship between this fluorescence accumulation of the 25 diverse parents and their parental allelic effects um, at the, uh, s across the 16 QTL, which I had done, um, but only uh, two of which were significant. Um, fluorescence accumulation has a significant relationship with QGLS 102, and callus plug deposition has a significant relationship with QGLS 106. And I will point out um, this point right here. It has quite a bit of leverage. So for this kind of work, our lab um, will typically go through and use confirm these relationships with um, near isogenic lines. But there's two neat points that I want to point out. Um, one being that um, Chao Lin Chung, a former lab mate of ours, had found this same relationship between fluorescence accumulation and um, uh, the 1.02 locus for the NLB pathosystem. Um, I just thought that that was uh, pretty neat. And she, she had done this work using um, the near isogenic lines. Okay. Uh, another point is that when you look at the um, G GWAS, genome-wide association, um, that you get from the NAM, um, uh, the, at the 1.02 locus and at the 1.06 locus, there's this, um, common, there's this common thread between the uh, functional annotations and the phenotype that we're seeing. So with um, fluorescence accumulation in the 102 locus, um, one of the underlying GWAS hits was the N-acetyl N -acetyl polyamine oxidase, which has, um, has a role in the hypersensitive response. And um, fluorescence accumulation in much of the um, micrograph or uh, microscopic literature it has um, is presumed to be related to the hypersensitive response. Um, and then at the 106 locus, um, there's four candidates that have a strong relationship with um, cell wall components, um, two of which, I, uh, this glucosyl transferase and fucosyl transferase, has a direct relationship with callus plug um, production. Okay, so. Um, the um, last mechanism that I'll talk about today, we think um, we can uh, confirm with being related to GLS resistance, is, um, may, is that it represents allelic variation of basal defense genes, and um, specifically with regards to callus plug deposition. Um, and I would modify this slightly and add that um, the idea that it could also be allelic variations in the hypersensitive response. Okay, so um, what else can we learn? These were the questions that I had addressed in the beginning of the uh, presentation. What else can we learn about the genetic architecture of um, resistance to great leaf spot? Well, um, I've identified novel QTL and better re resolution for some of the confirmed QTL. Um, how does architecture relate to that of other traits? Just specifically with reference to northern leaf blight, um, we see these pleiotropic loci and um, fewer greater effect QTL for GLS than for NLB. Um, is leaf venation a mechanism underlying resistance? It appears so, and specifically with regards to um, the QTL at uh, 4.05. Um, and the specific mechanism is likely uh, lesion expansion, reduction in lesion expansion and reduction in sporulation. 
our increased proportions of detox genes underlying um, a QTL indicative of the resistance mechanism. Um, we think that this increased expression of flavin monooxygenase is a good lead um, and we'll, we'll hopefully continue to make more progress on uh, towards that. And can plant host response identified in microgas be associated with QTL? I would say yes, tentatively, but it should definitely be confirmed with neuroisogenic lines. Um, in the meantime, we have great uh, candidate genes that can be tested with mutants. So uh, why do this kind of work? Um, I think it's important to decipher between pleiotropy and linkage across uh, the different traits that you're looking at, um, in addition to elucidating the mechanisms underlying um, the disease loci, because it helps improve the breeder's uh, decision-making capacity. And with that, I will um, do my acknowledgments. I'd like to give a very special thank you to Rebecca Nelson, my, um, my advisor. Um, it's been a really special six years, for sure. Uh, and Judy Kolkman and Tiffany and Santiago and my um, uh, Laura, my other lab mates, Jenny, is rotating with our lab. Um, thanks for, for the, all the support through the years. It's been um, really nice to have everyone around. And it's been astonishing to realize just how much of an impact your lab mates um, play. Uh, have a, how big of a role they play. Um, thank you to my committee members, Marcus Smith and Jocelyn Rose and uh, Eric Stromberg. You've, your door was always opened and, and really your networks on the ground were what kind of kept my project afloat. <laughs> um, the Maze Diversity Project and the um, accessibility of the, uh, the NAM seed. Um, Peter Bradbury, thank you for the, um, developing the HapMap GWAS pipeline. Uh, so I, uh, those of us who aren't computational geniuses can use it. <laughs> um, uh, the Buckler Lab, Ed, thank you for having your door open. I much appreciated um, for conversations. Nick, I'm not sure if he's in here right now, but he is insanely organized and was just so kind with our outrageous seed requests. Like, <laughs> thank you very much, Nick. Um, Alex Lipka, thanks for the help with uh, the GWAS, and Jason provided a lot of technical support. So. Um, Funding sources from Cornell, ASPB, Pioneer, Hatch, McKnight, and um, Bill, and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. That, that's all. <laughs> Thanks. Thank